The Vandals were a tribe of people who invaded Europe in the 4th and 5th century and for no apparent reason destroyed much of what they found there. Sometimes it seems as if the Vandals live again and have invaded the United States of America. I'm Rocky, and I grew up at Washington Heights, 188, 546, apartment three. Washington Heights was the birthplace of graffiti. I haven't thought about it. My God, it must be 30 odd years. I have not thought about graffiti. And now, like, everybody wants to know about it. Where did it start? Who did it? And it's like, in a way, maybe it's the past comes back to haunt you. I don't know. I was a tomboy. I think I put my first tag on the train going downtown to school. And I did it because I could do it, you know? If they could tag, I could tag. It started out as fun. It was something to do besides just sitting on a stool board. Washington Heights. Nice. This is where the movement kind of started. This is the Mecca. Working class people, mostly cliques of kids, gangs, roaming around, having fun. Trying to be the cool kids in the block, the one who could play hooky the most, and just meet girls and try to get things going. We were young. It was fun. She could be on the basketball team, you could be in a gang, or you could go out here and write on the walls. I can't say politics were involved. We were too young and self-absorbed. For me, it was nothing political. I understand it was the Vietnam War and all that. To me, it was an expression. I thought I was Rocky 184, and I'm doing it. We were not writing to make any political point at all. We were just vandals. Graffiti is the largest art movement in the world, a global phenomena that can be seen on the walls of every major city. However, graffiti is no longer relegated to the streets and has made its way into galleries and museums around the world. It can also be found on commercial products, from T-shirts to automobiles. And many of the world's biggest brands commission graffiti artists to create special products or design marketing campaigns. There is even an industry dedicated to the production of graffiti supplies, which generates millions of dollars each year. But there was a time before graffiti, a time when marker tags and spray-painted murals did not exist. There was a time when the walls were bare, the tile was clean, and lampposts were just lampposts. Well, these are the, my tools of the trade, where I first started out with. But these are not the, the, the original ones, like these. This is from probably 1971, 72, I would say. And I don't have any of my old pilots, but these were the pilots back then. It was only tags and magic markers, that's it. This, this is one of the first brands we started using, Red Devil. And then um, they had the wet look paint. And then this is some um, cheap paint from a store like uh, Home Depot. We used to get these also. As graffiti crews evolved, so did their supplies. Most of the writers were young and poor, so they acquired their tools by any means necessary. Pearl paint was the, the mecca where you could get the large markers, the ink, the pilots, the midi wides, the niji wides, and you know all sorts of colors. I'd buy it, and then if I could, I'd sneak one in my pocket. <laughs> the way we got the markers in the spray paint wasn't the usual way. We actually went out and, and stole that stuff. No, you steal a car, you don't steal a marker. <laughs> steal a marker? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> in the early days, writers used whatever they could get their hands on, from shoe polish to markers intended for industrial use. Now, they added spray paint to their tool set. A marker was a lot easier to go in a store and steal. 
spray paint now puts you in a different division. The long trench coats, you put your hands in, you could take your hands out. So you could take cans of spray paint and fill them in. They write their name around so they could be known. It don't make no kind of sense. They want to be known, they don't have to spray their name around, you know? So they really, you think they're trying to be famous? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it works? Yeah, I think it works. Yeah. What do you use? Do you use spray paint cans? Who, me? Well, anyone who does. <laughs> yeah, they use spray paint cans. Or magic markers. Magic markers? Or yes. shoe polish. Or what? Or shoe polish. Now, you seem to know. Are you an expert? Yeah. <laughs> We were like the celebrities, and if I hit a big, clean wall, 30 names would follow. Names tended to be clustered. If you wrote underneath a wall, the next guy wouldn't write around the corner. He would probably write right next to you. And they became bigger, they became more daring, and I was really amazed at some of the feats at some of these kids. The more dangerous the situation was, the more your name would be recognized. It was a sign of the times. It was a sign of our youth, our lack of funds, and possibly the lack of paternal guidance. We didn't care about people, what they would say to us. You know, actually, some of us wanted to be seen doing it. We were trying to get that reputation that, you know, oh my God, there's Henry 161 writing his name again, or Mike 171. We were very, very reckless in the way we did it. See, but my shit was hit and run. Hit and run. See, these fucking guys later on, they had all the time in the world. Go at nighttime, shh, take their time and shit, you know? A lot of other times, I was hitting the fucking subway, the motherfucker be moving, I was hitting the motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? And the girls just pulled this shit out and start tagging from everybody. But I felt that the women that were out there writing, whether it be Eve 62, Barbara 62, Michelle 62, Charmin 65, S. Pat, Rocky 184, you know? They had a lot more balls than a lot of guys had. When I was doing it, I was the only female that I knew about. And I, as I faded out, uh, Barbara 62 was all over. Her uh, crime partner was Eva 62. You couldn't see one name without seeing the other. My first impression of other writers and why they were writing and it was getting more popular was like people were angry. We wanted to be known. That's why we wrote our names. Anybody writing names like Marty was here 69 or Joe was here 72. He wanted to be known, he was there. But we did it in a different way. We wrote our street numbers. We didn't really realize that we were developing a style that nobody's ever done before, that would blossom into more graffiti. Seeing numbers behind tags started from the beginning. You see Tacky 183, I started writing Snake 188. It was just as simple as possible where you could read it. I used to write Snake One, King of All Snakes, because there were too many snakes around and I couldn't take it. <laughs> And uh, one time I went to uh, Snakes 2 train station, 145th Street, number one line. We were good friends. We went to junior high school together. But I went to where he lived, and I wrote on his subway wall, Snake 1, king of all snakes. You dig? You got that, George? His name is George. <laughs> there was a time on the New York subways when, without a newspaper, you could ponder the advertisements. Well, you can still ponder them, but you can hardly read them because of the graffiti covering them. It's even hard to read the graffiti for the graffiti. Now you'd think that with all this effort, something passably important or even beastly was being said, or something clever, as some of the old graffiti comments on life and the world. No. Now it's mostly just an attempt to identify oneself. Code names and numbers, Coco 4, K55, Supercool 223, Sonic 53, Fritz 171, and much of it in inglorious color. Legibility was important, and the thing is, you could throw it up quick. Simple, just black letters, that's it, J-O-E. <laughs> I uh, wrote Jack Star, and those are just my initials, J-E-C, and the star was just a little squiggly I did at the end. The whole idea, if you had a nice handwriting, and they saw your name there, 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 that meant you were there. It was not all about being fancy, and that came later on. Just spread all over the place like a fungus. Bathroom stalls, buses, inside subway cars. Everything was pristine one day, and all of a sudden you see all these names written. You're wondering, who are these people? And the more I saw of it, the more intriguing it became. Graffiti was entertaining for me. When I used to see a clean wall, and I had a marker on me, 
that was like, oh, wow, man. And I would go and start writing my name. The dynamic of writing your name, of doing something that's illegal, of having other people guess who's this person, is one of the many things that attracted me. So we noticed that everybody was talking about Friendly Freddy, Fantastic Eddie, Super Goldie. Man, me and my guys, we wanted the girls to gush over us as well. At the time, I didn't really think that it was illegal. I thought that it was just fantastic. I felt these people must be just somebody special. We were like movie stars of some of these people. I would see other people tag there and go, oh my god, if my name was up there with their names, man, that would be a great wall. They call themselves writers. I do not recall any of them calling themselves artists. And who are the culprits? Not surprisingly, they're kids, mostly male, mostly around 15 years old, mostly poor, and mostly what psychologists would call neglected. The words are rarely obscene or racial. Mostly it's just Mike this or Coco that, and the numbers are usually the streets on which they live. The first graffiti names, Tacky 183, Filthy Greek, Joe 182nd, Babyface 86, Stitch 1, Julio 204. The writer in New York who was thought to have started it all was a teenager named Julio 204. Most writers count him as their first influence, but few actually knew him. The first graffiti I remember seeing was a person who marked the uh, bottom of a lamppost. His name was uh, Julio, Julio 204. Julio 204, he, yeah, he definitely hit those lampposts first. Julio came out of the blue. We started seeing about 1967. It was nothing in big size. It was just noticeable because there was nothing else up on the walls. And nobody really knew what it was. We thought something was going to happen on July 20th at 4 o'clock. Then we realized there's a guy going around writing his name and his street number. Julio was uh, like a little Colombian guy. He said, sure, yeah, I can put Julio on there, but it's no big deal, so I'm going to make mine more known. So he started putting 204, so the girls or everybody would know who he was. Well, when I kept seeing his name, you know, you hear the mythology of him being p perhaps a gang member, um, and just like a cat marks its, <laughs> its terrain, Julio was marking his terrain and his people's terrain. See him a lot up in Fort Tryon Park, Washington Heights area. Columbia University marked their C for the football team on this huge rock. We were hanging around there one day, and a friend of mine said, let's climb to the top of this thing. So when I got up to the top there, I saw on a rock, this guy tagged his name, Julio 204. I go, this guy is everywhere. You know, in my own childish way, I was impressed by that. <laughs> so I'd like to get my name everywhere, too. No one knows why Julio 204 stopped writing or what happened to him after. But by the late 60s, his marker tag had stopped appearing. In the 1960s, America was in a state of social upheaval caused by issues like civil rights and the Vietnam War. Political leaders were being assassinated, and it seemed like everyone's lives were threatened. In the midst of all the chaos, the country's urban youth started to speak up with markers and spray cans. Meanwhile, in Upper Manhattan, in a neighborhood known as Washington Heights, a small community of Greek teenagers picked up where Julio 204 left off. I grew up in between Inwood and Washington Heights. I met Greg, Phil, and Taki because I was affiliated with a Greek Orthodox Youth Association, and we all played basketball together. That's how I met them. So my father was self-educated, and he, um, he exposed me to a lot of things. And uh, part of that was, you know, trying to be an individual of some kind, and, you know, I was I wanted to do something different. You know? <laughs> I wanted everyone to know who I was. So my first name was Phil. My last name began with a T. So my moniker was Phil T. Greek. It was unusual, it was unique. I wasn't Puerto Rican, you know, I wasn't Irish, I was Greek. So I wanted to make a Greek mark, you know. Julio 204 was very legible, and I wanted mine to be even more legible. I felt that it was necessary for my name to be in block formation. I didn't want it to be script. I wanted them to see it, and see that it was done almost mechanically. When Phil started writing in the summer of 68, it made it more personal because all of a sudden we knew who the guy was. It was like a, an inside thing. I saw Phil T's name and uh, my friends would ask me, is that you writing that name? And I would take credit for it, even though I wasn't even tagging at the time. 
because it fit my name so perfectly. And then we just kind of tagged along. Me and Little Phil started doing it too. I didn't like when they started writing because that's my thing, you know? We kind of wanted to be like Phil, you know? In that regard, like with music and graffiti, I guess. Even the drugs. I don't remember him being unhappy about it. Certainly he didn't voice it. And what I do remember is how we thought it was pretty cool that we could both write the same name and get twice as much traction for it. He piggybacked on my name, and I didn't like it. But I stopped by then, and Phil started, and he became known as Phil T. Greek, actually. He developed more notoriety. But there's no way you can beat Daki. He was everywhere. <laughs> you know? I've always been called Taiki by everyone. Taiki is a real name. It's derived from Demetrius because when you're a little kid, it's hard to say Demetrius. So you tend to say Taiki. It's, it's a very common nickname in Greece. And it either sticks with you or it doesn't. And, but only a Greek would know that it's a name, basically. I never thought of getting anything out of the graffiti. It was just something you did for the summer. I was either with Phil or Greg, and they were writing, and I said, oh, let me try that. And I just put Taki, and I said, oh, let me put 183, because they're putting the year, they're putting Greek. I'll just put the number, like Julio. The graffiti was also part of the friendship. I mean, it was the sports, it was the friendship. You moved as a group, so let's go up to the bus terminal. That had nice, smooth walls. We'd hang around the church steps, we'd hit the church steps. When we go to basketball games, we always carried a marker, because you got a tag along the way. It kind of, you marked your territory in a way. But the, during the summer of 70, I was working as a messenger, and the way you made any kind of money is they'd give you the car fare for the delivery, and you'd walk it. So if I had to walk from 57th Street to 86th Street with a package, I would just zigzag. And every time it was a red light, I'd stop, put my name on a pole. You know how much you can cover? Taki183 started writing his name in neighborhoods outside his own. And people around the city started to take notice. Well, the first graffiti that I noticed and uh, that I admired a lot it was Tacky 183. Tacky was top dog. Tacky took it to the match. I mean, I think this kid lived to write his name. <laughs> the reason I started with Marco, right, because Tacky 183 started with Marco. They had seen him hate with paint. So, oh, look, no, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> I didn't start it, but I was just the next step. The boy got up. There's no denying that every place you looked, you wouldn't see Tacky. All the neighborhoods had not seen graffiti, but especially in a pristine neighborhood, it was much more evident. You could walk 40 blocks and see my name on every pole. Park Avenue, Lexton Avenue, Madison Avenue, Sutton Place, all the cross streets. And it just hit them all. And your name would be there, and people would say, how did you write it and nobody saw him? That, that was the big mystique of graffiti. Taki was original, and uh, to watch him in action was funny. He had a leather jacket that he liked to wear, and he had a hole in the pocket, and he became good at being able to put his hand in the pocket and tag a door on a train. You know, then he'd walk over to another door and do that one, and you'd never know he did it. Part of the rationale of not thinking you were that destructive is because politicians would put up Nixon tags, and you knew they weren't going to come back and take it off at the end of the campaign. So I said, if, if they can do it, I can do it. My parents thought it was pretty terrible that I was writing everywhere, but then I think they got the joke of it, that they knew who I was, but nobody else knew who I was. Taki 183 became an urban legend and remained a mystery to the public at large until an enterprising reporter from the New York Times tracked him down. In early 71, I was impressed by an article in the New York Times about Taki 183 being the first of a new type of graffiti writer. Taki 183 spawns pen pals. When this was published, we really saw that it was becoming a citywide news, and it was a good story for a slow news day. The Taki article gave what we were doing credibility, because now we knew we were being noticed. I didn't have any hesitation about speaking to the Times, because basically it was all a goof to begin with, and over here you got this legitimate paper interviewing you. You know, they interview Kissinger, and they're interviewing me. You know, how ridiculous can it get? When I read that article, I was writing, but I just thought, wow, they blew him up, yo! I'm going to do this more, <laughs> you know, because I wanted to get an article. I don't remember seeing any article about Tacky in any newspaper back then in those days. All I remember about Tacky was a commercial they used to show on TV. It was filmed inside the Statue of Liberty. And they would show the uh, 
persons walking up the stairs inside the Statue of Liberty, and as they were walking by, you see the name Tacky 183. The Statue of Liberty commercial was a result of editing. Actually, that was at the uh, A-Train station, I think on 181st, with the long steps. Whoever made the commercial filmed the family with my name in the background. I, I have to hand it to this guy. He, like, he gave me so much publicity. When I was photographing graffiti in New York, Taki was already a legend. After Taki was everywhere, there was an explosion of taggers. Summer 71, they interviewed me for Interview Magazine, Andy Warhol's magazine, which was pretty cool. They told me to come down and meet Andy Warhol. I said, you know, I've got no time for this guy. <laughs> Taki 183 was the face of the graffiti movement in New York. But just 100 miles to the south, Philadelphia had its own star. I was established in 1965 at a reform school, and Mr. Swanson, who was the head cook, used to always prepare white bread with our meals. I used to always remember how my grandma used to bake cornbread. So I used to get out of line and go in the back and say, Mr. Swanson, how come y'all don't serve cornbread on a, on a menu? And he gripped me by my shirt and took me out to my counselor and told my counselor, keep this cornbread out my kitchen. And all my peers at the table start laughing, go on, pray, go on, pray. And throughout the institution, which was infested with gangs, who wrote their names all over the walls of the institution to recognize, to be recognized by their gang name, I wanted recognition too. So I wrote Cornbread, real big letters, right by all the gang's names. But I took a step further than that. I wrote my name in the visiting hall, in the child hall, in the bathroom, in the school, in the church, everywhere. When I came home in 1967, I took that same concept to the city walls to establish a reputation. And I wrote my name everywhere. People started talking about it. It wasn't long before other teenage juveniles began to spray paint their names. In North Philly, Cornbread was joined by the likes of Titty and Dr. Cool, while in West Philly, there were writers such as Chewy, Cool Earl, and Cool Klepto Kid. My name is Edward Leatherbury, AKA Cool Klepto Kid, AKA The Kid. When I first started writing graffiti was, I believe, in 67. Small tags with magic markers, and it escalated into uh, spray paint. It started out as a small band of us that hung together, and that was myself, Cool Earl, Chewy. We came from the hood, so to speak, uh, the ghetto, you know, uh, rat, roach-infested areas, uh, people not having very much. And we went out and, and pretty much put our names out, and it was like, we're here. Well, one particular day, um, Chewy Kid and myself and a few other guys was writing on the L's in Philadelphia, and Eddie decides to write his name on the L's. He wrote Kid. And I'm sitting on the L in the seat, and I'm looking at him write Kid, and I'm thinking, well, get me. Write my name up there. And uh, to my surprise, instead of just writing Earl, he wrote Cool Earl. So, Kid was the first person that wrote Cool Earl for me. I chose to use my real name, but because of that little art flair in me, I knew I could come up with something special. So, you know, and to this day, there's only one dude I know that could really do it like me, and that was my man Joe Cool. I got the name Joe Cool from his cartoon character, Snoopy. When I turned 13, my parents sent me to karate school. And, you know, at first it was they used to tease me and call me Karate Kid and stuff like that. And as time went on, you know, I just, I couldn't shake it. And here I am now and still can't shake it. I have people right now, right now, that, that they don't know my name. It was just more of a vandal type thing. We were just on the subway writing on the uh, cardboard advertisement, it was like a Zorro type of insignia. We were going over South Philly, North Philly. We was going all over the place. Everybody wanted to be cool just like us. Everywhere. I, I, I see this guy's name. I said, how did they 
do that? How did they get it here? How did they get up there? We were just having fun. You know, cops chasing us, they couldn't catch us. You know, it was a cat and mouse type thing. You know, when we were hitting and they'd pull over and jump out and try to catch us, all of us were, were pretty fast. And, you know, we was having fun. We went on excursions at night uh, in the bus terminals when we thought that uh, no one would see us, and we hit every bus we could hit. I used to live with my aunt, and my aunt used to tell me, look, if you're not in the house by 9 o'clock, you got to sleep in the hallway. Every night, we would go out and write, and I never got home at 9 o'clock, so I slept in the hallway a mini night. We didn't want to be a part of gangs. That's why we broke off into different clubs, uh, Delta Phi Soul, uh, Cornbread, was a part of North Philly, and, and in West Philly, me and Cool Klepto Kid was a part of Club Old Digma Experience, meaning cool experience. Writers from both sides of town belong to crews modeled after fraternities with names like Phi Odigma Experience and Delta Phi Soul. The crew's main focus was to throw parties at social clubs, so it was only a matter of time until both groups of graffiti writers met. Let's say we would hit a wall, a clean wall, and we'd come back at a later date, and Cornbread and his crew would have hit that wall. So we started leaving messages, and, you know, and finally we did connect. Uh, we met at a um, dance hall, Shanahan on Lancaster Avenue. West Philly used to fight North Philly, so we knew that was going to be some trouble outside when we went to North Philly. So I seen Cool Earl on a cool cap. So I told him, I said, Cool Earl. He said, what's up, man? I said, what's up, Cool Earl? He said, what's up with you? Who are you? I said, I'm Cornbread. He said, no, you ain't cornbread. I put up my marker. I got the felt with my once to hit the wall, cornbread. And he just says, no, Chewy, uh, Bobby. He started calling the whole gang. Hey, go cornbread. And then just hugging me. We, we, we recognized each other by reputation. And uh, we introduced ourselves, and it was like, you know, it was great. You know, finally I meet Cornbread and Teddy and Dr. Cool and Took. But uh, when we met, it was just, let's go tag some walls together. You know, that set the party in tone. <laughs> With North Philly and West Philly writers united, graffiti in Philadelphia spread like wildfire, and the media picked up the story. I think the name that got me the most was Cornbread because it was so unique. It said so many different things, you know. All of us had good names, but, you know, Cornbread just was an easy name to, to stick in your mind and, and easy to remember. And uh, the more we got into it, the more publicity we kept getting. There, there, there were some imposters during that period also. <laughs> so I'm going to work one day. I got a job at Nabisco Bacon Factory, and I open up the newspapers, and I read about my own death. The fantastic career of one of Philadelphia's best known graffiti artists came to a violent end Sunday outside a hotel and bar. My reputation is going to this guy's grave. I had to do something to let the public know that I still exist. So I had pondered countless possibilities and came to the conclusion to spray paint my name on a live elephant at the Philadelphia Zoo. I went to the zoo, spray paint in hand, came over the fence, and came to his pit. I walked up to the elephant, and I wrote, Cornbread lives. I got locked up that day. When the police officers learned that I was in custody, all the cops started coming to my cell asking me for an autograph. My name rang like Jesus Christ. They talked about that in the newspapers, and it just blew out of context. Cornbread, he's the most famous it was. This guy, name on elephants and stuff like this. You know, and I had, that's pretty bold. You gonna go to the zoo and write your name on an elephant? You know, because again, we were always trying to find the wildest things you could possibly find that would get the attention of other people, you know? And you know, this, of course, this was really wild. So, I mean, this is off the chart to go over a fence and spray paint an elephant. Vandalism is one of our country's biggest problems today. Estimates for destruction to school facilities alone is over $100 million per year. And counting all acts of vandalism to public and private property, some experts push the figure to over $1 billion every year. Of course, a $1 billion is only money. But what about the tens of thousands of these young people convicted of these crimes? I had some sources in the black community in Philadelphia, and 
couple of them said they could help me find these guys. So we set up a meeting at the Philadelphia Inquirer. I remember May 2nd, 1971, Today Magazine did an article on the aerosol autographers and why we do it. That was my mission as a reporter, to explain it. But when people read it, they took it the wrong way. The Inquirer received 400 letters, and people were genuinely angry. They took it as an endorsement, and it was never an endorsement. I think at that point, things really blew up, and a number of other writers came out of the woodworks. See, see somebody wrote up here, the crew. I don't know who put the crew here. Oh. That, that happened a lot. One person would put their name on the wall, and then in the long run, everybody would hit, especially the, the top names. And as soon as the top names hit, then you had all the followers, bang, 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 bang with, with their names up on it. It'd be, you know, like Cornbread put his name up on the wall, and everybody would hit. I looked at it as an archaeological kind of a thing. What are people going to think when they unearth this civilization and they see this stuff? New Yorkers and cats from Philly shared some kind of symbiotic relationship. I don't know what it was, but it was real. So, you know, guys from Philly who say we were first, God bless them. Guys from the Bronx who say, no, we were first, God bless them. Who's to say who's first? It's not that important. If it never went anywhere, it wouldn't have mattered who was first or last. It's only important because you want to establish how it started. You know, I know guys from other cities, they're saying we were first. Well, that was good. But, you know, there, there's kids that never left their neighborhoods. If they were the first in their neighborhood and they had never been to Washington Heights, when, well, then they were first there. I lived on a commune in 1970 up here in West Kill, New York. Um, so after I came back from that commune in 1970, and I landed back with my own group of friends in Central Park around the Bethesda Fountain, that's when I started riding, really. But I remember in 71, you could go on the number one train or any station like that on the way up. Every single piece of the white tile would be tagged, like totally bombed. I remember the first time I went uptown and like the doors opened up on a, on a station like that, I thought, oh my God. If you never saw anything like it. It was scary. You didn't feel safe right away. You felt like if people could write this much all over the place, where are the cops? Like, this is wild up here. Our society has gotten to a chaotic state. That's when the outside of the trains are getting hit. And thing, I mean, there were hundreds of riders then. I thought, oh my God, this is a scene. This is a cultural explosion. A dramatic scenario staged by the MTA shows what could happen to a graffiti artist as he decorates a subway car. The trainer said the guard dog, handled by a private detective, is programmed to attack on command and stop on command, but not to kill. Even the threat of violent death has failed to keep graffiti artists out of subway yards and tunnels. At least one death by fire in the past year, one by decapitation, and two by electrocution on the third rail. Is it possible then that such dedicated artists will abandon their natural habitat to avoid being bitten by a dog? For News Center 4, Bob Teague. With walls covered in names, legibility and street numbers were no longer enough. In order to stand out, writers had to add style. In my world, wearing a crown meant that I became a king. As we started adding crowns and bubbles and squiggly lines, it became even more entertaining, more fascinating for me. And I kept trying so hard, but I could never come up. Like, I just, I couldn't bring my skills up. And SJK, you know, Mike, 171, these guys were like, in my eyes, they were artists. And I couldn't bring myself to that level because my level of art was taking the 45 apart and putting it back together while I'm blindfolded. That was my art. I, that's it. That's the old Henry 161. Writers all around the city started to embellish their names with arrows, stars, and even characters. You know, style didn't become an issue until like end of 1970, 71. Then all of a sudden it became who had the best style, who got this, who did this, I'm gonna blow up. Everybody had their own unique style, you know, just like a signature on a, on a check or something. After I started writing my name, 
I saw them putting designs around it because I kind of like these things. I used to put like a little flower on top of it and the peace sign underneath mine. First it started with just eyebrows. And then if Earl hit on a wall next to me, I would draw eyes like I was looking over at Earl. And it was an art form that I got your back. I'm watching you. I definitely started the eyeballs. <laughs> the stars on the side. And I may have started the eyebrows. I'm not really sure. I don't want to take credit for something that I really didn't do, but I really do believe that I may have started that. Yeah, I, I did invent the, the crown, and then other people tried to portray that and make their own crowns, but there wasn't the same. I was the one who first started. Babyface, 86, that was the crown. You know, some other person saying it was him, but not. Nah, nah, he lied. Cornbread started hitting Cornbread King of the Walls and started putting the crown up, and everybody started following suit. So no question, Cornbread started the crown, to my knowledge. Commissioner, what part of, what part of your manpower and uh, how much of your budget is devoted to cleaning up after vandals? Well, the direct cost of vandalism, uh, we figure at about $1,100,000 a year. The indirect cost is very much higher than that because we're constantly having to divert men who could be doing constructive work in the green parts of the park uh, to doing, uh, to correcting anti-social anti and often very vicious acts. At the moment, uh, we are dealing with it with a, with a program which tries to act on the principle that if you can catch vandalism quickly, you prevent that further deterioration which sets in. And we have organized uh, squads and trucks in each borough which are going to be able to go out and do the minimal but necessary repairs on the spot. When that's done, they leave a sign saying, we've been here in a preliminary way, the vandals have done their work, but PRCA will be back. I became attached to it. It's like a disease, I guess. I never left home without my magic marker. I should get home late at night. From the morning, I should get home all fucked up, full of paint, all the hair all over my hands, you know, like, then go home, eat, take a shower, back the same shit next morning. It was an escape route. I would forget the streets, I didn't think of no violence. I didn't think of my mother getting beat up. I didn't think of anything bad. It was, my mind was just focused on the graffiti. We were adventurous, you know what I mean? We were like, govelous gov 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 travel, you know what I mean? <laughs> you just want to go on an adventure, you know? Get out of your neighborhood, see something different. They know me as uh, Mike 171, Mighty Whitey, the Uptown Mountain Maker, Downtown Heartbreaker. From the city with no pity, so nice they had to name it twice, New York, New York. If you mess with me, you will see how much trouble I can be. Always with 38 and 45. But they were my spray cans. That's how I expressed myself. It's how we grew up, man, you know? Uh, my father died when I was 12 and 68, October 19th. Steve's father left his family. Steve's the oldest of four kids. And uh, we had to go out in the streets and uh, provide for our families, you know? And this is where graffiti came in because we kind of started letting loose. You know, I was angry at the government. You know, my father taken away. My younger brother just died a few years ago. I had an incident that happened to me I really don't share. Uh, I was uh, pushing robbery. Guy pushed me in the hallway, beat me with a gun, put me in the closet, ransacked the house. And what he did, he undressed me, raped me. And uh, he put a knife to me, gun to me, and he penetrated me, I blacked out, 13 years old. And uh, at that point in life, you know, I share this because it's, it's something that I have to reveal of who I am today because of that made me, uh, closed down, I put a steel casing around my life, I put a brick wall around that, and I just went on a suicidal, homicidal mission. You know, I was graffiti all the time, out in the streets, drugs, gang banging, the whole nine. And I don't care if I lived or died. You know, the gangs came to us and said, listen, you guys live here, we got a gang, you want protection, you want nothing to happen to you, you gotta join with us. The older guys that were like 15, 16, 17 years old, they were starting to wear their gang jackets. And that caught my attention, because it was more violent. And I liked it, the violence, more than I did the graffiti. So I started being a gangster, but a graffiti gangster with, with my jacket. But new gangs were more vicious than ever and heavily armed. Most writers wanted to avoid them, but others were ready to join. They tried to take over one of my division, but uh, they didn't quite make it, and we killed two of their guys. They tried to burn down my clubhouse. We killed two of their guys. And five of their guys rolled up on one of the savage nomads. You know what they told them? Oh, we're going to give you hell, baby. We're going to give you hell. And they didn't even kill them. That time, we had uh, this little group called the uh, Latin Lords. It was me, Babyface, a cousin of mine from the Bronx, 
a couple other brothers though, you know. He told me, once you got to become savage now, I said, bet. So I see your baby face, let's become a savage snowman. And boom, we became savage snowman. This was, this was the beginning, you see? We did a new club. Then after we got established, for you to join the club, you gotta go through no different shit, though. Get initiated, get your ass kicked, and whatever, though. I was uh, affiliated with the Hell of Five Sisters. It was a group of girls, and we would hang out. And a lot of times we go to 104th Street, and we get together with the Savage Nomads. It was a good time back then with the, the gangs. Back then, you'd get into your fights, you'd have your stabbings, you're fighting with the chains, fighting with bottles, and then the next thing you know, a month down the road, you guys are friends again. When I was kidnapped by the, the Jolly Stompers, I was DJing a party, and they came to the party and uh, with guns and knives and took me to, to the, the, the headquarters and made, made me sign a treaty to join them. Back then, the initiation for the gang that I was gonna get into, the Galaxies, was 10 wax with a garrison belt, army garrison belt, and 10 people would take one shot each at, at your ass with your pants down. But in my case, I didn't have to do that because the night before the initiation, I went out to a school dance with K161. And uh, we had to take the girls to 125th Street where they lived in the projects. And we got approached by some gangsters called the Black Spades. And even though we didn't have jackets, they still wanted to beat on us. And one of them grabbed an antenna and swiped it across my face. So the next day when I went for my initiation, I had to get walked into the clubhouse because my face, my eyeballs were too swollen and I couldn't see. So my friends that walked me into the clubhouse to get my initiation, after they seen me, the president of the gang said, oh, no, no, it's okay, Henry doesn't need to be initiated. He got his initiation last night. Just like we'll never know if New York City or Philadelphia was first with graffiti, we'll also never know which had gangs first. What we do know is the effect the rise of the gangs had on wall writing in each city. 69 up into the 70s was really the hard gang air. The drugs swept through the neighborhoods like a plague. And it was the heroin, and all this social activity went to the wayside. A whole lot of my good friends started dying. Philadelphia was like Vietnam. The gangs were so bad. It was, this is one that I'm still alive. A lot of guys I grew up with dead or in jail. Certain neighborhoods you couldn't even write in because the gangsters didn't want you to write in their neighborhood. Gangs only wrote on walls and their turf to identify their turf. That's one thing I didn't mess around with. I, I, I never put no gang stuff on the walls. See, because that was trouble. You ask for trouble when you put, you, you write gang stuff up there, you run up on a gang, and that, then you get in trouble. You, yeah. You know, yeah. you write sure. gang stuff, they go, they, oh, yeah, I mean, we got in trouble. Remember, we got in trouble. It was on 60th Market. One one day when the, oh, when, yeah, when the yeah. moon oh, was right, the moon, right, 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 right. <laughs> the moon was chasing us. Yeah, I'm talking man. about oh, we, we heard you wrote your name on our turf and all that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I, I told him, remember I said I wrote my name in a whole lot of turfs. <laughs> <laughs> I, one thing I didn't, I didn't back down from. <laughs> But I knew when you get out of dodge and things got crazy because you knew most of the time a knife or a gun was coming out. And I could sense it's time to go. Writers who were also gang members faced the difficulty of a dual life. This is our area, Young Galaxy's area. This is our territory. We still were gang oriented, even though we were doing the graffiti. Because like, like this, you get busted, right? Then they, they, they say, hold on, Joe 182, Savage Nomad. You know? This is the same fucking guy, though, you know? I don't want to get no little you know, blame for bullshit, though. And if I get busted, John 182 is a different story. I get busted with doing gang shit, that's a whole different story, you know, you know? So I keep it like that, though, you know, keep it apart. Most writers were not in gangs and hung out in small, unnamed groups that lacked organization. But in the summer of 1971, that started to change. If it was in this book, it had to be before 74, because that's when I went into the Navy. Right. SJK, yeah, the Greek fella. He's a nice guy, too. Writer's Corner. It's a very interesting corner, that Writer's Corner. That corner right there is where Snake One used to live, my nephew. My sister had an apartment there. Writer's Corner was a corner that was developed, uh, I believe, by uh, Snake One and Stitch One. Stitch One is the one who invented Writer's Corner because his girlfriend used to live uh, about maybe 50 feet away from the corner. Before it was Writer's Corner, 
it was Stitch and Rocky's corner. Stitch and I were in love, and uh, he, he, was, he treated me like gold. His parents, I go over there, it was like Christmas. Anytime I went over there, they treated me really well. There's where my father had a problem. He wasn't very fond of Stitch. Stitch One was a tough guy to master at arms of the group. He would take care of us. Anybody mess with us, Stitch took care of them. And I was so much a little bit of that too also. Stitch was tall, dark, and bow-legged. His family came out of Cuba. And he just had that face that just hang and wait to see who came up. Then SJK171, myself and Jack Starr, I met Snake One, Stitch One, and Cat 87. They asked us to be members of the Writers Coin 188. Now, that was kind of a borderline between the gangs of Washington Heights. This was a meeting place, the safe haven. We used to sit there, spray painting that corner. There used to be a writer's corner truck that everybody hit. And the guy didn't seem to mind, because he gave up cleaning the truck. I don't remember anybody's legal name. We all knew each other by our tag name. After a while, all the writers from all around the city, from Brooklyn, Bronx, they would all come up there. We hung out there. We'd go to Writer's Corner to see who else was on Writer's Corner, what other graffiti writers we could meet, what other styles we could pick up. It would get packed in a matter of seconds. Their markers, their cans, what they're going to go, what they're going to do. And we kind of combined everybody together, you know, like opened up. Number one question when you met a writer was, do you write? And when they said yes, it was, let's go. And it wasn't looking at them for what they looked like or who they were or how they spoke. So the gangs, the colors started coming off. So graffiti kind of broke down the barrier of the gangs. It was that unification of we are all writers. It was our spot, our moment. It was a way for me and Stitch to always be together. I look back at it as uh, people say, you know, you got to be a certain age to love and feel. I really love Stitch. I think I, I put him so far in the back of my head. But when we talk about him, he was one true love. And that's how I look at graffiti. Stitch one, Rocky 184 equal graffiti. <laughs> that's how I look at it. Writer's Corner was the hangout spot in Manhattan. But across the Brooklyn Bridge, writers Friendly Freddy, Fantastic Eddie, Super Goldie, Flowers Dice, and Undertaker Ash, as well as the gang The Vanguards, developed a local style, complete with loopy letters and lots of flair. The Brooklyn writers that, that I experienced, seen the most, and it was mainly because I took several trips down to Brooklyn, were like Flowers Dice, Undertaker Rash, and their styles were so much more unique that it sort of created a, uh, a need to go back to Brooklyn more often to see what was happening. I just, the best I can remember Flowers Dice as being something like that. It was fairly simple because they were very, very early. I just remember him looping the F a bit and, you know, Friendly Freddy with a bit of a flourish, but not, you know, like the subsequent Brooklyn style. You know, because Brooklyn style was always very fancy. Uh, for example, you can do a, a simple end like this, or you could do the, I think, the knoll end like that, or the Vanguard fancy Brooklyn style end. The style changing from straight letters to script, if you will, or designing, it was an evolutionary process, I would say. Sometimes you had to write quicker, faster. You, you, you start incorporating art into it. Personally, I love the Brooklyn style. It had much more flourish to it and pizzazz than any other before and since, other than maybe the, the Philadelphia guys. There are no 120s or 161s or anything like that in Brooklyn. You know, all the streets have names. And I think it's perhaps a more individualistic place than some of the others. Undertaker Ash. Undertaker Ash is a good friend of mine. Been a friend of mine for almost 40 years. And at one point in time in Brooklyn, and if you ask real people who have real memories, Undertaker Ash was everywhere and probably was the number one graffiti writer in New York City. My name is Undertaker Ash, it's, it's my tag name. I started writing from 1969 to 1970. 
Everyone wanted, wanted a tag name that's original, so I always look at the Undertaker as a very mystical person. And, you know, he, he never dies in the movie. He's always the last guy in the movie to live. So I said, well, I'm going to use that name, The Undertaker. It was a social thing, you know. But then hanging with the guys, it just elevated to another step. There ended up being a core group of us that were hanging all the time that were doing that. And um, one Friday after school, we decided to go to Dino Nard's house and sit down and actually have a meeting. There were a lot of people there. There was about 20 or 30 guys there. And um, Dino Nard had a brilliant idea uh, to try to bring graffiti artists under a banner. And the organization was the Ex Vandals. Um, they would soon become probably the most popular graffiti name out there at least in the Brooklyn scene. What he did was convince everybody, you know, also from a marketing standpoint, let's take a period of time, you know, at night, go to all the places that everybody is going to see and bomb the shit out of it. But let's not write our names next to X Vandals. Let's get X Vandals out and create a buzz. For like the first month, we stopped tagging our own names and we strictly only wrote the group name. Ex Vandals was the beginning and end all of everything. Our names came second. The buzz was, what the fuck is an Ex Vandal? People thought the Ex Vandals was a gang. They didn't realize that it was just a graffiti movement. So we figured out a way that we could actually come out and see what our reaction was. So everybody painted Ex Vandal jackets. And we had a plan where the first day of the week, Nard would wear his in the school. The next day, two more cats. So by the end of the week, we had all revealed ourselves, and it was like, whoa, <laughs> you guys in the X-Mandle? Yo! And it just, the reaction, everybody went crazy. Travelers on New York City's subways are offended daily by graffiti sprayed on subway cars and station walls in an incredible profusion. It's not funny. Cleaning off the mess is expensive. Over the years, New York has become known for just about everything a city can be known for. It's crime, it's wealth, it's filth, it's slums, it's architecture, it's art museums. And now it's rapidly becoming known as the graffiti capital of the country, a title Philadelphia has held for years. Believe it or not, we had morals then. A lot of these guys just write on anything, anybody's house, property. I never wrote on anybody's property. That I know of, you know, other than big businesses, no one home. I'm not gonna go up in their door and write my name on their door and stuff like that. Maybe in the projects, in the hallways, I might do it. You know, I'm not justified it, but you know, you did have some morals about you. Some guys did, some of them didn't care. They write on your dog if it come by them, they don't care. You know, cause that dog go to walk from here to there and they see somebody see that name. We used to want to get in the paper. So what would happen? We used to call, you know, the paper and let them know that we were gonna give it up. So what we would do is, you know, they would arrange a meeting and we would come down there and we would turn over our spray paint cans and tell them that we retire. You know, that's it, we wasn't writing no more. And it would be in the paper the next day. But just as soon as we left out of there, we started writing again. I mean, we never, gave, we never quit. I mean, it was just a thing where we just wanted to get in the paper. Purists say this explosion is not clever graffiti, just childish and ugly scrawl. Whatever it is, street art or vandalism, it's costing millions to rub it off. I do remember this bubbling anger in Philadelphia at so many things. There was anger at the police. There was anger at the police commissioner. There was a tremendous amount of violence. At the height of wall writing, Time Magazine estimated there were 10,000 more graffiti writers in Philadelphia than New York, and this did not go unnoticed. Then Mayor Frank Rizzo issued a full-scale war on graffiti with an anti-graffiti campaign. His ultimate goal was to put as many writers in jail as he could. The Philadelphia Art Museum responded with the DUO, Department of Urban Outreach, which gave positive options and brought new opportunities for Philadelphia's wall writers, ranging from mural projects to sponsoring a city bus to be painted by the vandals. The graffiti attended workshop invited all these kids to do graffiti in a constructive way and possibly get paid as opposed to doing graffiti damage to people's property. The scepter gave us a bus to paint. And uh, we had a multicolored bus. We had paint, you know, it was a design we put on paper first, and then we took this bus and we painted it, rode through our neighborhood, and anytime that bus came around, we were allowed to ride on it. Free, free of charge. And the funny thing about it, out of respect, nobody never rode on that bus. This is the graffiti workshop's bus. There was a certain purity to what the first generation of writers did because there was no payoff to it other than local fame. 
That changed in 1972. What happened was, we're hanging out at 174th and Fort Washington. And we're hanging out on the wall. There's this big wall that we used to sit on. And the entrance to the park was like in the middle. But here comes this older gentleman, beard, glasses, and he's asking for names of writers. And he comes up with my name. He says, I'm looking for Henry 161, for Snake, Joe 182. And he's asking, do we know Stitch One? Older gentleman. Uh, says his name is Hugo Martinez. We didn't know who he was. We made, you know, thought he was a police officer, so we didn't tell him anything. He told us he wasn't a police officer. He said he wanted to do some things, wanted to get the graffiti off of the street, put the graffiti on canvases, make the graffiti known to people. He called it art. My understanding is that Hugo was a student of sociology at City College. He wanted to mimic what was going on in the streets of subways in a uh, college art room. The word got around that we're going to meet this day at City College. And um, so we still didn't know if we should trust this guy. So me, Stitch, I guess Cat, Web2, we went to City College, but we couldn't find the building where this was taking place. So we just kept walking in all the buildings. Finally, we walked into this one building. All we smelled was spray paint. We said, yep, this is the place. It was like walking into heaven because we had all this beautiful, white, clean paper and all these markers. And we used to have to rob our markers and our spray paint. So for us to see all that there for free was fascinating. And we just went to work and started drawing. We spent about two or three hours in there just writing and painting. And by the time we were done, Hugo was like, Oh, my God, that's beautiful. Martinez organized 20 of the top graffiti writers and founded United Graffiti Artists, UGA, in an attempt to take graffiti off the streets and into galleries. UGA included writers such as Coco 144, SJK 171, Phase 2, Snake 1, Bama, and Mike 171. UGA brought together some of the best at the time and enabled them to start to transcend the former criminal activity into a accepted format and started the movement of so-called graffiti art. It was actually a creative environment where you could pretty much write, paint, draw what you always wanted to write, paint, and draw on a train. Hugo works it with the city that if we stop hitting city municipal buildings and trains, buses, they give us a workshop and they would give us canvases and spray paint. So we made a contract not to go out there and put our art on canvases. This group is called Graffiti Artists United. They meet in the apartment of a sociology student who has encouraged them to go straight. Everyone who's a member has given up subways and public walls and has turned instead to canvas or paper or the sociology students' bathroom walls. Although these particular graffiti artists paint legit now, they still remember the good old days, last week or so. Did you ever get arrested? Once. Did you do it again after that? A couple times. How come? Because I just wanted, you know, I wanted to get known. And uh, like then I made a lot of new friends. You know, after you go, you know, after you're in the yards and you write your name on every train, like the day later when they come out, you just sit, you know, in the station the whole day and just watch your trains going by, different colors, real nice. You know, I give him a lot of props for his concept to put 20 of the top artists together and have it be formed by their peers. It took a lot of things to conceptualize. We had meetings, you know, we decided where we wanted to go, what we wanted to do, what kind of materials to buy. Pretty much everybody took on a responsibility. He started selling a lot of our paintings, and he said that he was selling our paintings so that we could have more materials to do this. So we said, OK, we agreed to it. We were young, we didn't know what was going on. All we know was that we was getting free markers and spray paint to do graffiti. We were getting paid. We thought we were getting paid. He had people that wanted their apartments graffiti, but I don't mean people from the Heights. I mean people from downtown, Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue. People inviting us just to ride on their walls and stuff while everyone's partying. 
and we're exposed to like this high society. UGA was the first group to actually sell graffiti on canvas. UGA is what ground broke the writing culture into the art world. Bill Hart from the Razor Gallery walked up and handed me a check. And I went, what? How much do you get? He goes, I got mine. I said, oh, this is mine? Thank you. Uh, when we did the uh, Joffrey Ballet, you know, here I'm a kid, I'm 15, 16 years old, I'm getting a standing ovation in the city center in New York City. I, I never imagined this was gonna happen. And how good it made me feel about myself and how good it made everybody else that participated in feel. I can't even explain it in words, man. It was just, just living it was, was grand. UGA introduced graffiti to the world at large, and it was a positive experience for many of the writers involved. Some, however, have different opinions. You go capitalize. Nobody cared about the money, but you know, you talk about people that we need money. We're getting older, we want to do things. So yeah, he caught your ear, caught your eye, the green, and I feel he sold a lot of pipe dreams. Hugo wasn't promoting them, you know, the, the, the writers. Hugo was promoting Hugo. But after you're doing galleries, you're doing shows, money's coming in, and we're not seeing a penny. Red lights go up, the flares go up, you know? He's not the one out there spray painting. He's not the one spending the whole night up in the yard getting paint on you. Then we come back all soaked and peeling shit off for hours off our hands and faces and changing our clothes, you know what I mean? We're the foot soldiers that did all this stuff. And he comes over and becomes a glory hound and he wants it all for himself. And uh, you know, in New York, don't go that way. So one day we confronted Hugo, we brought some of the guys, me, Henry 161, a few other guys. We bum rushed inside and we just t tore the place up. I told Hugo, you got our money, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. You know, you come in our neighborhood and you do this to us, you can't do that, we're not allowing this. While everybody was trashing the place, I was trashing Hugo because I didn't care about none of the materials. All I wanted was to crack his head and I really did. Good, too. Henry161, uh, myself, Joe, these guys came with bats, chains, stickball bats, stuff like that. They went upside Hugo's head and a couple of the other guys that stood in the way. Yeah, I feel graffiti lost a lot of its purity with Hugo, yeah. People were, you know, sad and, you know, everybody just broke away. No matter what the writer's experiences were, UGA changed graffiti forever. It marked the beginning of a multi-million dollar industry, but as some would say, the end of graffiti's innocence. Remember Kilroy, the peripatetic GI of World War II who was always there? Well, he's not here now. And anyway, he never made his mark with the graffiti experts of today. That's because he didn't have a spray paint can and a felt tip pen. For these are the real villains of the graffiti explosion quick and easy to use, and difficult to erase. It occurred to us to interview some of these people, those who leave their marks, but that would be giving them too much of the recognition they seek. They have their medium, and their medium is perhaps the message, a callous disregard for society and a vain attempt to be somebody. Moments like New Yorker Magazine are key because cats were only getting props from other writers, and the people in their neighborhoods all knew what the deal was. The minute it came out in the magazine, it was like media coverage. And that took an awareness to a whole nother level and, and gave the press that much more juice. And it became a whole nother ball game after that. The fame and the article, and once the newspaper and uh, television picked it up, really hurt the graffiti because then everybody started doing it and it got out of hand. Graffiti is a fancy word for an old custom writing things on walls. The thing that really made me crazy is when they made Turk 182, the movie. It was like, you know, the, the guy just said, let's call it Turk 182. It, I mean, he had to base it on me, the, the name. Obviously, the movie wasn't based on me. Three weeks ago, he hit the Battery Park. A week later, the Super Train. Now it's everywhere. I remember the movie Turk 182, and right away, I thought of Taki. You know, and I haven't seen Taki in years, but right away, I went right to Taki. When Turk 182 came out, everybody said, they're using your name. I want to talk to you, Turk. Because uh, it was a subliminal thing. People were reading Turk 182, but they were seeing Taki 183. 
I called up Taki when the movie Turk 182 came out, and I asked him, did you consult or did you get any money on it or something? He goes, no. I go, okay, whatever. We just laughed about it. Although Taki could laugh at a Hollywood movie stealing his name and inadvertently bringing him even more fame, not everyone else was willing to take the commercialization of graffiti so lightly. The graffiti changed once that dollar figure came in. Joffrey Ballet and the first painting was sold. It took the purity of what we were doing out of it because there was no value. There was, it was priceless. It was like a Mona Lisa. You know, this was our work. This was from our hearts. This was our souls. This is the life we were living, the hardship that I just shared with you guys. I think if they stopped, if they stopped names in the newspapers, maybe they would stop doing it. You mean maybe we even shouldn't be here? No, like, y'all throw, when they, when they spray their name, they want it to be shown on the newspaper. So y'all show it and they get what they want. But if y'all stop, if y'all won't show it on the papers no more, they won't do it because they know it ain't going to get around. Although we'll never know if Philadelphia or New York started graffiti, it should come as no surprise that they both experienced the bittersweet end of wall writing's innocence. The ideas that appeal to the first generation of writers to start writing in the first place would ironically be the same ideas to sway the wall writers as their opinions toward graffiti began to shift. By 1972, I had stopped writing. It, it just, there was nothing else to do. I was a writer of convenience. If I was there and it was easy, I would do it. But it was never important to compete. You know, I didn't want to start hanging off bridges and going into train yards. Just like I, I never considered myself an artist, at some point, the guys that were doing it, they have such fancy stuff and they're switching nozzles on cans to get different effects. That, that was like over my head. The fact that graffiti has become a multi-million dollar industry to me is absolutely insane. The commercialization of anything and everything is a particularly American phenomenon, so I'm not surprised about it. There is nothing that America as a country hasn't commercialized. And seeing as that I never made a dime selling any canvas to anyone, I have always been a tagger, wall writer, and agree that if you want to do this kind of stuff, I wouldn't say break the law, but if you want to throw something up on a wall and appreciate it for what it does to that wall, that's the essence of it. You're not tailoring what you do to satisfy a specific audience that's external to yourself. What we did as kids had nothing to do with anyone outside of our world. We were just being us, which ended up starting this movement, which is now a culture. Graffiti just it wasn't just writing your name. Graffiti was an expression of how you dressed, how you danced, and how you reacted with the, the youth around you. If you think about this art form from 1969 to 1972, all the major innovations happened in those few years, because it went from simple marker hits to massive spray paint extravaganzas. It all adds up to, to, to one big story. We were just, didn't have anything to do at the time, I, I, you know? Sports, if you weren't good at it, if you weren't involved in the gang, you didn't have anything else to do. Let's go right on the subway. And I look at it today, all these years later, and I'm fascinated by new names, and I wonder if the reasons for why kids did their writing is still the same. If I were a betting person, I would bet that it is. So to all of you people that um, had to paint your walls over and over and over, dot, 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 et cetera, I, I apologize to you from the bottom of my heart. Graffiti is attractive to kids because it's a cheap way to get notoriety. If you're not a great athlete, you're not a great scholar, you can always be a great writer. You know, you, you walk into a place and say, well, that's the guy that scores the most baskets and that's the guy that writes a lot. Back then, these were the celebrities because they were all over. Everybody knew them. Even if you didn't know them personally, you knew the name. Be honest, I don't know if it's addiction or the fame. It was more like a job. <laughs> for me, I just live for today. You know, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, so I lived it to the fullest. It's the worst already happened to me. The worst you could do is cage me up, put me in jail, whatever. You're not going to take away who I am. You know, and so graffiti was a way of me expressing myself, putting it out, as you see. Mike 171, to you with love. And I think the reason why it was never legalized or never sanctioned was because they're afraid of freedom, you know? Not you, but you know, 
They're afraid of freedom of speech and thought. They don't really want that to exist. And there were no leaders, and there was no school, no institution. The people themselves developed it, and they got together and found out that the differences between each other weren't so different after all. We were family to each other, and we made each other feel important. We showed each other love, and graffiti did that. Phil went his way, and I haven't seen him in 35 years, even though I do see Greg. Taki, we were friends, we grew up, but we didn't communicate afterwards, so it's really neat. I mean, 35 years later, I would have never imagined that graffiti would bring us all together. I'm glad you came out, man. Yeah, yeah. that was full circle. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was a nice time in my life. I cherish it. They were good friends. You get me to cry, man. <laughs> I was a sensitive guy. I'm glad that at least it spawned um, artists. That, to me, I, 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 I sort of like that. And once everybody's doing something, you know, you're nobody, you know, you know. Even if you say, oh, I was the first one, people are like, so what? Somebody's doing it bigger and better, and you're no longer a celebrity. I had a great time with it. And I'm proud to say I was an originator. I was, uh, you know, the first ones to do it there. Yeah? yeah, I made my mark. And I did something new. I, we were crying out to notice me, you know. Here I am, the kid. Stop the world, let me off, you know. Uh, Cool Earl is love, you know, cornbread king of the wall. I had put my time in, I established my reputation, I did things that no other writer's going to do. So my time had expired, my time is over, it's over for me. I've been called a legend in my own time, so you can't get much better than that. How many guys get called legends? Uh, that, that's pretty cool, I guess you can't get better than that. What do you think about graffiti? What's that? Writing on the walls. I think that's pretty over there. You don't like that? Ought to make their pants pay for it. Every one of them. Lock them all up. Lock them up. What do you think about the writing on the wall? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? No. Do you like it, not like it? No, I don't like it. You don't like it? Why don't you like it? Well, because it doesn't look very nice. I don't know what they're trying to say. As long as there's no profanity around it, it's all right. Usually there is no profanity in it. They're usually names and... Uh, well, it's, it's better it's than bad. the bad. Yeah, you're right. I agree with you. I do think it would be a good thing if they could catch the culprit or the culprits who are responsible for desecrating the walls. Uh, I think it's entertaining. I think they're very um, pertinent. They're very catching. And they're very truthful, and they're, put, they're presented in a really good way. It's conveying a uh, socially constructive message, isn't it? The others give a message, but in order to understand it, you have to understand so much more about the people who wrote the message. If it's not channeled, the kids are just going to continue to do it. They have a lot of energy. You know, take this energy potential and put it to use. It's all right with me just as long as you don't write on my wall, you know? Don't that make sense? It does make a lot of sense. <laughs> I think that's the crux of the problem. <laughs>
My life post graffiti is, uh, I'm glad I don't carry a marker around because I'm always tempted to write. 